guys, the Fight Bananas podcast is supported by Daniel Martinez, the law offices of Daniel Martinez. I solve problems. Guys, give him a call at any time at 877-5-RIGHTS. That's 877-5-RIGHTS. Or check out the website at martinez.law. Daniel Martinez, the law offices of Daniel Martinez in your corner. 877-5-RIGHTS. Also, check out Fusion CBD products. Check out the website at FusionCBDProducts.com. Guys, you know I drink the waters. Six-pack for nineteen fifty. It's an incredible deal. Also, lately, I've been using the instant CBD Instant Rub. There's a relief rub and also a CBD cream and muscle for joint pain. Guys, make sure you go to FusionCBDProducts.com right now. Hit them up on Instagram at FusionCBD and check out the website at Fusion. CBDproducts.com. Hello, world. What's up, guys? Dave Van Auken, once again, back again on the Fight Ass Podcast. How's everyone doing? Guys, we can officially say it. It is Fight Week. Here we go. So excited. Man, kicking it off. Three fights, Fight Island, but Holloway, Calvin Cater to set it off. I cannot wait. This is a featherweight main event. We're going to talk so into it. Huge show. This is going to be over. We got two hours of content coming to you. Uh, Pretty soon after, I got a little fun story. I got Zach from Coffee and Chaos. He's jumping on, and we're just literally talking it. You know what I mean? It's fight week. We're going to preview UFC 257, Connor and Dustin, uh, Michael Chiesa, Neil Magny, and the other fights in the cards. We just have a really broad, really cool conversation. Who wins, who loses, who's next. Telling you, it's a good one. After that, I'm going to give you my top three choices of of out-of-the-box 2021 matchups I would like to see. We keep on hearing the same two, three, four fights over and over again. I'm going to throw out a couple ones that I think would be phenomenal matchups to watch in 2021 that no one's talking about. And then we close the pod back, the three guys with coffee and KOs. We're going to have UFC superstar Grant Dawson come on the show. And uh, the interviews, it's awesome. It's so good. It went long, which is great. It's 40, 45 minutes long, but it's absolutely gold. So uh, let's get right into it. Um, Okay, so the fun story and... Probably the the thing, there's so many benefits of having this podcast and, um, you know, creating connections and talking mixed martial arts, talking UFC and uh, stuff on UFC Fight Pass. But easily the number one, easily, and it just happened um, organic. I called my good friend Jacob Killer Kilburn. He's fighting Saturday night, Fight Island. Uh, he's he's excited. He's he's really excited. His second fight underneath the banner. The first fight was a really quick, short notice fight, which was awesome because we broke the news to him. But Jacob, I knew that he was about to uh, fly over to Fight Island. We FaceTime each other now and then, and literally I FaceTime him, and he's walking through. I can see like the terminal. I can see the uh, the tunnel from the airport. Uh, you know, wait in room kind of a thing to the plane. He's walking through to it to fly to Fight Island. And he answers the FaceTime. It was just so good. It was just like, you know, we talked a couple minutes and it was just like, hey, you know, let him go. Uh, let the hands go. It was just fun that, um, you know, the connection that we got. And I'm just so pumped for him. So excited for Jacob Kilburn. A humongous fight. Uh, I, I can't wait. I know that he's trained so damn hard for it. I know he's put in so much into this fight. Uh, one of the longest camps in history. It's been over a year that he moved down uh, to American Top Team, training with some of the great mixed martial artists today. So um, just big ups to Jacob. Jacob Killer Kilburn fights Saturday on the prelims, which leads into the main card, which is on A, B, C. Man, I love it. Maybe uh, you know, maybe uh, A, B, C needs to go to banana soon. You know, we, we got to make sure we do it. But here we go. It's a long podcast. Hopefully, you have some fun. Stick with us. If you got to listen to it in a couple different, uh, you know, scenarios on the way to work, on the way home, before bed, I think you're gonna enjoy this uh, mega mega episode UFC 257 preview, Fight Island preview, Kiesa and Mag- uh, Neil Magny, uh, Calvin Cater, Max Holloway. So much right here on the. 
Fight Bananas Podcast. What's up, guys? Uh, Dave Van Auken, Fight Bananas Podcast. How is everyone doing? Uh, joining me, my main man, Zach Coffee and KOs. How you doing, brother? How's it going? Can't complain. How are you doing? Doing good, man. Doing good, man. First, before we get into UFC, it's finally coming back. It's been a... Uh, I feel like we needed a break, and I felt like it was good to get off the, uh, you know, the, the mouse wheel a little bit, the hamster wheel. But now it's like I'm, I'm itching. I, it's been too long. It's been two, three weeks almost. I'm ready to get back into fights. Uh, the UFC is definitely taking care of us with Fight Island. But before we get into the fights itself, man, we can't wait for you, Steve, the whole Coffee and KOs team. Um, man, you guys are doing it. The recap in the show, we're going to start off with Hall- Holloway and Cater. Um, kind of, you can't go you know, wrong with that. Uh, we got Kiesa and Magni Wednesday. And then I don't know if you heard of these two guys, uh, Poirier and Conor McGregor, UFC 257. Uh, it's going to be a great week, man. I'm pumped. Yeah, you know, first off, we're super excited for the opportunity to be able to do the recap shows. Steve is obviously not with us. He's the other half of our show. And uh, what stinks is, you know, so we get in contact, you know, we're really excited to do the shows and then we get a month break and it's like, man, we are chomping at the bit to get back. One of our favorite things to do is the recap shows. We like making the picks beforehand, but yeah, there's just nothing better than talking about what just happened, especially the night that it happened. And uh, we're super excited. So I feel like the three weeks was nice. I feel like it was a little long though. I feel like two weeks would have been good. And then this Saturday, if there was a card, I think that would have been perfect. I know for me, like my Saturdays, I love to sit down and just watch the card from the first fight to the end. Yeah. And uh, so it's been, it's been nice to be able to hang out with the family. Like, like yourself, I have children too. So it is nice to kind of sit back and enjoy it, but I'm definitely ready to get back and uh, watch some fights, especially with the the slate that they are, have been putting out already so far. Right. It, it's crazy. We'll talk about like the week coming up and then we'll talk about the, um, you know, avalanche of so many fight announcements. I kind of threw out that post maybe a week or week and a half ago about how there was literally zero title fights booked. It's been the first time in the history of the UFC since like UFC two, three or four that there's always a title fight booked always a couple months in advance, even longer. Sometimes there was nothing on the docket uh, with Jan and Sterling was pulling off and then Megan pulled out. So they're for a while, there was just no titles after Figueredo defended it or in the draw. So I'm happy that all this stuff is kind of coming out. Uh, we'll kind of jump into that. Some fun matchups, uh, heavyweight matchup. Um, you know, I know you guys are big Tom fans, so we'll talk about that. But so much. Okay. So Fight Island, I love the Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. I loved it. I, they did two Wednesdays, I think, in 2020. Um, just huge fan. It's just... Uh, you know, we're, I'm used to watching NBA on Thursday nights for TNT and Monday night football is great. It's there's something about during the week, you put the kids to bed and boom, there's fights. It's kind of like a bonus. How big of a fan are you with three cards in one week? First and foremost, in this situation currently that we're in, I love it. Um, okay. you know, so I'm, I have the ability to work from home right now due to COVID. So I love it. I, I don't really like the start time on the Wednesday card. That's the only thing I really have to complain about. I think that if you're going to do a Wednesday card, I feel like six o'clock is, is a good to let the main card start at six. I feel like the casual fan doesn't really have to see the prelims, but make the main card start at six um, for it. I think it believe, I believe it starts at 12 or maybe it starts at three uh, or the, I think the prelims start at 12. The main card is at three. Right. Um, and I, that I don't like, but I do like the three cards in a week. I mean, whenever you have the chance to see more fights, I'm all for it. Uh, you know, if, if I'm not watching the UFC, you know, I'm, I'm typically trying to watch something throughout the week, MMA or UFC or some, something related to that. You know, like you said, football, you have Monday, you have Thursday. Now with the playoffs, you got Saturday, Sunday. So, um, you know, I'm excited for, uh, for the, the three typically, technically three fights in the, in a week. Yeah, I, there has to be a legitimate reason why Dana would put it on during the day. I, I really don't know why. I The one thing I know is that it's pro, it's nighttime for Fight Island. So Wednesday night at that, Magni and Kiesa will be going on at 10 p.m. or 11 o'clock like they would probably hear in the States. But it's weird that, you know, especially out of all days, you think a Saturday they do it for Habib Nurmagomedov sometimes. And I actually, that's kind of cool once in a while to have that Saturday during the day card. But for it to be Wednesday... Uh, even me, like, uh, you know, I got other stuff to do and family stuff to do and work stuff to do. It's, it's pretty tough that it's during the day. Um, but, uh, I'll figure some way out to watch it and, um, talking and it's, 
usually, especially Fight Island, there's so many little diamond in the roughs. And I went through the cards and we'll kind of let's jump into it. So the all three main events I love, the the Connor and Dustin is could be the fight of the year, could be the poster of the year, whatever you want to say. When Connor fights, it's a big, big deal. Um the co-main event, Hooker and Chandler, that's finally done. That's awesome. But there's not a lot of other sparks. There's not a lot of sometimes in, you know, even like this last card in December, right? So the main event was uh Wonder Boy and um Jeff, but there was so many other, there was just fights across the board. There was Showtime, Pettis didn't even make it on the main card. Uh, we had the uh, Vera and Aldo, and there was just so much all throughout the card. There's not a lot of that. There's a couple hometown guys. There's a Jacob Kilburn. He's my guy. Been on the show. He's a brother of mine, and uh, he fights on Saturday. Michael Beast Boy Davis fights Mason Jones. Uh, Mike Davis is a, he's from the 386. He's a, he's been on the show five, 10 times. I've seen him live. A lot of his uh, pro fights before the UFC. So there's a lot of connectiveness to me, but there's not a lot of diamond in the rough, sir. Am I off or do you, do you agree or? No, I a hundred percent agree. I was actually talking to, to Steve about this and it's like when you, when you have like a Connor card or something like that, you're expecting like especially to start out the year, like you're expecting almost like what the last two cards were like at the end of 2020. Mm. And I'm looking at the card and, you know, nothing against these guys. Like I love watching Nick Lentz fight. All right. I like Nick Lentz. He's a warrior. He puts on good shows, but at this point in his career, he's not a guy like that's not going to get me excited. You know, to, it's not jumping off the card for me to me. I'm not, you know, I feel like most of these fights, I mean, don't get me wrong. Cater Holloway, in my opinion, has the chance to be, a potential fight of the year right off the right. bat. I mean, those guys are bangers, but you know, for, for me being a fan, I want, I just, I want wars and I want to know the guys and you're better with the prospects than we are. We're more of like who, you know, who's fighting currently and, and who's the top guys. Like we're, we're more of those. You're great with the prospects. So you, you can maybe enlighten me a little bit more, maybe some guys to watch out for, but I know for me, you know, I'm looking at the, this card and, you know, Justin Taffa, he's okay. He's four and one, like at, Philippe, Philippe, the guy he's fighting is nine and one. Like these guys are right. on the main card. These are guys I want to see on the prelims kind of build their way back up or build their way up and see how they, how they do down the line. So I, I was a little disappointed, but at the same time, from some of the interviews that we've done, I feel like a lot of guys fight Island sounds so glamorous, but a lot of them are not a fan of it. The, the times that they're fighting uh, from what I've been told, there's a lot of taxes 100%. and issues that are, that, that 100%. go into it. So it's hard to get some guys to go there. I mean, Scott Holtzman's a friend of our show, and he said there's no way he's fighting in Fight Island. He said he yeah. did it. He's at the taxes, everything that goes into it. It's just not worth it. Um, so I I can see. I feel like this has been the last couple of Fight Island cards that there's 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 always a one or two really good fights with big names on it, but then the rest of the fights are kind of eh, you know. But the, I also love those because I feel like those guys have something to prove and they go out and normally right. put on a hell of a show. We didn't know uh, Heisman Chemayev, you know, at Fine Island six months ago, and at the in October, he, I, I really thought the UFC dropped the ball. I thought he was the biggest star in the whole company for like two, three months. And if they could have gave him one more at the end of the year, that could have been really big. Um, yeah, there's just like I said, there's a Nurmagomedov, an undefeated Nurmagomedov on the Uf, uh, UFC 257. There's a couple really other, you know, good fights. And there's a couple cool veteran fights at like Carlos Condit versus Matt Brown. That's pretty cool, you know, for an old school guy like myself. And you're right. Like I, I love the regional scene and more, probably more prominent than that. I love UFC fight pass, uh, um, icon, or if it's Island fights or LFA and cage warriors, I love watching it. So cage warriors, I've seen Mason Jones. I've seen him win two weight class champions. And now he's fighting Mike Beast Boy Davis, who the same thing I've seen him fight five times live. Uh, these both guys are savages at 155. It's, they easily could be the fight of the night. And it's just a, it's a, it's a, bur a berry prelim. So there's definitely, there's going to be some fights that really jump out, but there's just for your, maybe the middle class fan or for the mid, you know, midstream fan. There's just not a lot. There's just not a lot of meat in the bone. The main events are incredible. We lost to my Evan Edwards. It happens. It is what it is. But Calvin Cater and Max Holloway, it's, uh, I'm a, I love the Connor Dustin fight. That fight is so close. That fight is so good. And it's funny too. I had Calvin Cater's on fight bananas. Huge fan. I like him. I like the group, the New England cartel. I like Tyson a lot. 
I just think people are overlooking Max Holloway. I, I saw like a really 100%. bad post, but something about if he loses and he's one in four. And it's like, what in four? Dana White says Max Holloway just beat Volkanowski in the last fight. He could be the featherweight champion of the world. So let's just throw that out right away. The first Volkanowski fight was borderline 50 50. And then, so that's the champion, the undefeated UFC champion, Volkanovski. So he lost there too. One was to Dustin the Diamond Poirier, who, which it's not, it, you know, if you're not Conor McGregor or Habib Nurmagomedov, you lose too. And, and that was he, a weight class up. Yeah, a weight class up for the very first time. And then he just, you know, he's fighting again here. I just, I don't know. I, I didn't really like. I feel, you know, anyone could say that Conor McGregor went one and two in the UFC in a little chunk, but you know, he lost to Diaz, two weight classes up revenge the fight and lost to Habib like it happens you know yeah 100 percent. I I listen Steve is a Massachusetts guy so and New England cartel has been great to us so I, I you know I'm not gonna sit up here and you know bat, Calvin I think is on a run he's been great but Max Holloway is potentially one of the greatest featherweight ever I mean the dude the run that he was on right. the, the people he's fought you can't overlook a guy like that. So, I mean, don't be wrong. I, I like that that cater. You know, he's coming in as the underdog. I like that the the matchmakers are or the the people in Vegas are at least giving Holloway that respect. But yeah, I think people and and the other thing is Holloway doesn't get finished. Like, when when has he gotten finished? So, I mean, Calvin, I think that this fight's going to be a war. But I, from what I've noticed with Holloway, if you don't finish him, which doesn't happen. He's going to stand there and he's going to throw with you and he's just as good of a boxer. So I think that that fight has potential to be, like I said, one of the best fights of 2021 and we're getting it right off the bat. First card of the year. It's going to be yeah. an absolute banger. Yeah, it's uh, and I've talked to some people, some kind of inside people. It's a quantity versus quality. Max Holloway is going to throw more punches. He's going to touch him more. Uh, Calvin's going to throw less but heavier and probably better shots in a way if you want to say that and it's just kind of what one the judges see and two you know we sometimes those punches like with max he doesn't put all the power into it but you just keep getting hit 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 and bust an eye you bust a nose or three four five in a row come at you real quick it's just you could just get days quick and max will finish someone or if calvin throws a short elbow like he did against jeremy stevens um you know, I, I I love hearing that. You hear that all the time. Oh, he's never been finished. And then until he's finished, it's going to, you know, it at this high level, I hate saying this, Max Holloway is going to get TKO'd sooner or later. Just it is. He's in the business of, of TK and own people. So it will happen. I don't think it will happen this time. I, I It's really close. I don't want to even make a prediction right now. We're still just a tad off. Uh, I just think it's a really great fight. It's really close. Um I wouldn't be surprised either way. I, I really wouldn't. Uh, I like both guys. But I like both men. And it's going to be a great fight. And, yeah, like I said, the probably the fight on this for me is a Jacob Kilburn, Austin Lingo. Um, Jacob Kilburn, yeah, like he's just a friend of the family. He's been on the show multiple times. Uh, you know, we broke bread with him. A great guy. He fought on really short notice, five days notice in 2019, I believe. It was even before 2020 in the whole of COVID. He trains at American Top Team. Um, he's fighting, you know, Austin Lingo and it's one of those fights. It's a uh, winner moves up. Winner kind of really gets his UFC career losers in a real tough spot being zero and two in the UFC. So it's a real important fight. Yeah. You know, that, that's the one thing that stinks about like, you know, you're starting off your UFC career. It's really hard to, to just, you know, if you drop two in a row, it's not a good look, especially early on, you know, like if you're Max Holloway, you drop two in a row, it's Max Holloway. You know, if you're someone who's just kind of getting that start really, really tough to, uh, to just, you know, start out. zero and two. And then it's like, where do you go from there? So, um, like I said, I'm not, I don't know the prospects like you do, so I'm not a hundred percent familiar with those two, but, um, I did have a question for you though. I did want to ask. Yeah, buddy. Do you think that if Holloway wins, he's obviously going to fight for the belt fight, whoever Ortega wins between Ortega Volkanovsky. Does, does cater get the same, the same treatment or a lot of people are saying that cater has to run it back with Zabit then because that's kind of been his lone loss uh well so many different i i almost it almost bugs me when people are on the fence or not going all in on the answer i just don't think there's a correct answer 
if Calvin Cater knocks out Max Holloway in a minute and a half with a short elbow and it's massive and it's huge and the rest of the fights, even the Connor Dustin's not as what we think. And we look back a week later and Calvin Cater is the name. He's the buzz name. He probably gets next. He gets next right off the bat. But then you got to go back to the title fight. Volkanowski's the champ has never lost in the UFC. If they go to a five round war with Ortega and a, a split decision, they might run that back right away. Or if Ortega goes through him, or if Volkanovski goes through him, you think, yeah, they might make that. They might go right away. I don't think Zabit's in the way. I really don't. I almost think he's. They try trying to say the right. He's he's always in a um, trying to make a fight. Him and K, uh, Calvin almost fought a couple times. Him and um, not Jan. Who has he almost fought a couple times with? Now he got hit with uh, PEDs. Oh God, I I, I know um, who you're talking about. I can't think of I can't think of the fight though. He threw the nasty elbow to Korean Zombie. Oh Yair, Yair Rodriguez. Yair Rodriguez. Yeah. So he's been in like a back and forth thing with him. It's like I don't know. Like I feel like the UFC in that division is so damn good. It was actually one of my bold predictions. I think there's gonna be three champions in that division in 2021. I don't think uh, Dana White wants to slow down the division with Zabit. Zabit just seems like that guy he fights once a year. Maybe is he injured? Is he not? Uh, he wants to really choose his opponents. Uh, that's just the thing I get from him. That's kind of what I see. So I just think it's a wait and see. It's like if, if it's a five round fight and, but either guy somehow just doesn't meld and it's not a impressive victory, probably not. Calvin won't just jump to the title. I think if Max wins, regardless, Max fights Volkanovski for a third time or Max fights Brian Ortega. Yeah, I, I agree. Which is yeah. a rematch. I, I agree. I think Max has kind of earned that. I think that yeah. Hollow. I think uh, Cater has to put on a top-notch performance. I think Holloway just needs to win because I like I had Holloway winning the second fight. I did have him losing the first fight, but I had him winning the second fight. Right, and he dismantled Brian Ortega. So, um, yeah, I I, I 100% agree with you. All right, so kind of moving on to Wednesday. Um, man, I'm, I'm I'm a little bitter that we're not going to see Chimaev and Leon Edwards. Uh, I thought it would be I, – I was so intrigued. I really liked – I thought Leon Edwards was a, getting really overlooked in this fight, which, you know, number three in the world, hasn't lost since Usman, seven in a row. Um, and I just don't know where Chimaev is. I just haven't seen enough of him. I really thought – I would wish that Gerald Marshart would have went longer and didn't, but that's maybe how good uh, Chemayev is. So we don't have it. We'll probably have it in February at some point. So the main events, uh, Michael Chiesta versus Neil Magny, which is one of these fights that if you're really in it, we know how good both these guys are. They're not huge names. It's not a huge draw, but it's a really great fight. And uh, like I said, I don't, I hate being on the, on the fence. I, I don't know on this one. I really don't. I try to look it back. It's a really tight money line. I, same thing. I wouldn't be surprised if either guy wins this fight. I think I'm leaning Neil Magny. I think that's a that's a tight, really short fight. I'm I'm kind of leaning towards Kiesa on this one. I think okay. Kiesa has been very, very impressive in that division since he's not cutting weight anymore. He's he seems healthier, um, and I just feel like he's he's still rounding out his game. Magny, you know, Magny's had a very up and down career. You know, at one point he's like, you know, he's a world beater and then he kind of falls off and now he's on this streak again. Um, I love both guys. I like Michael Chiesa. I think that, you know, he's very, very good. And they're almost one in the same. I feel right. like they're very, very similar fighter. Um, you know, where where Chiesa's, I think Chiesa does have the advantage on the ground. Um, and I think... I don't know though. Like I want to say Kiesa might be physically stronger, but then you look at Neil Magny and he's a super strong dude as well. It is a very, very tough fight. Um, and it's a very tough fight to predict. Uh, so I'm kind of leaning towards Kiesa based on what he's done. And I really like what I've seen since he moved, he's moved to the division. But like you said, I can kind of see it going either way. It's really, really hard to, to choose. And I'm not going to be upset with whoever wins because I really like both guys. I think both of them are, are very, very good. And, and Magny, I think is kind of, towards the tail end like he's he's kind of exiting his prime so i wouldn't right. mind seeing him you know keep keep up the streak and keep going keep kind of building that momentum but either way i don't think it brings him to the belt so it's so funny you said that and like i said that i this is really cool open format usually we have a guest or we have a main topic we're just going to let it run and see where it goes so we just mentioned the two main events uh holloway and cater magni and uh kiesa 
And it's so funny when sports, people think of who's your favorite football player and basketball players. Let's just think of basketball real quick. I'm not trying to bash basketball. I was a basketball player in high school, played all four years. I'm a basketball guy. But it seems like most of the top guys, they want more money. They always want to get traded. Um, they're not good media guys. Some of them are good. Some of them are not. Kyrie Irving thinks the world's flat. I don't know. The UFC, their main event guys are the some of the coolest, nicest men and the, some of the ladies in the world. Cater's a great guy. Calvin Cater's a good dude. Max Holloway's an awesome guy, a family guy, Hawaii guy. Like he's so um, you know, connected with his community. We just mentioned Magni and uh, Kiesa. Everyone likes them. I think the opponents that lose to Magni and Kiesa likes them. Um, we'll go to the other fight. Just, there's probably no fighter, I think, in the UFC more respected than Dustin Poirier. Everyone loves Dustin. He's just that middle-class American guy, tough as hell, goes to work, gets the job done, does ton for charity, does ton to give back. He's connected with a lot of fighters in camps, been American top team. He's just... He's just one of those good dudes. And then maybe the villain out of everything is Conor McGregor, who since the whole Habib thing and since he kind of the Floyd thing and kind of, you know, almost getting it off his chest. Hey, maybe I was drinking too much. Maybe I was a little bit too far off. Dude, the guy seems like an awesome family guy now. He's, he's spending Christmas with the kids. He's at home. He looks in the greatest shape of his life. Like, that's the villain, uh, the family of three now, and the guy who's in great shape. It's just it's amazing how combat sports and they're fighting and gladiators, and if you really don't get it, they think that we're they're savages, but they're some of the nicest dudes in the freaking world. Yeah, it was funny when we got into doing this, Steve and I, when we started doing the interviews, I'll be honest, I was so nervous. I never talked to any of these guys a day in my life, like expecting, you know, them to to kind of not be the nicest person. And like our first interview is Rob Font, like Rob Font, one oh, of the top dude. ranked guys. And it, we're a new podcast and he's you know, like, yeah, I'll come on your show. Like that doesn't happen in any other sport. If I'm, you know, if I'm, if I have a football podcast and I reach out to Patrick Mahomes, there's no chance that I'm going to get an interview with him. But to reach out to, to someone like Rob Font and for him to come back and be like, yeah, I'll come on your show and give you 30, 40 minutes of my time, like that doesn't happen in any other sport. And I always say this, like these guys are nice because I feel like they're humbled. Like most of these guys fight for a reason. They fight because that was their way to, to make a name and make a living for themselves. And, you know, when you get punched in the face for a living, I feel like that kind of humbles you a little bit. And I feel like all of them have that. I mean, you're going to have every, in, in any sport, you're going to have guys that aren't the nicest people. But uh, for the most part, I think in, in the UFC and MMA in general, I think most of these guys are nicer than you can put them up against almost anyone in any other sport. And they're just as genuine and nice as, as anyone else. I, I just, I really, like I said, this is the, we're, we're early coffee and chaos is new and we've been so like floored by how great the people are. And like you said, how do you root against anyone of these paper in these pay-per-views or in these main events like it's so hard because like you said it's impossible to really nice, them. Tell you, dustin was one of the coolest guys in the in the world uh, just awesome talked to me for five seven minutes uh and then it was so funny at the end it was uh probably two three weeks before he fight habib Nurmagomedov, and we we're just chatting about it. he said he felt great said he had a good you know he, he really thought he was going to get the job done and I was walking the way. He's like, hey, make sure you buy the pay-per-view and tell everyone to buy the day of pay-per-view. I was like, all right, man, I got you. Um, I, I think you made some really good points about one, uh, mixed martial arts. And martial arts is a humbling sport. It's You can always get better. Um, I think Khabib Nurmagomedov, four fights ago to now, Israel Adesanya from three fights ago to now, are better fighters than what they were. It feels like the better, they just keep on getting better. Like there's just always a little time to level up. And then two is, I think as a team, James Harden makes $45 million this year for the Rockets. He kind of makes $45 million if they win the championship or if they get, don't make the playoffs and he averages 22 points. These fighters make more money. On, their name is their brand. Conor McGregor, makes more money if more people follow him, watch him, want to talk to him and buy the pay-per-view. Like the and every fighter's like that. Even the first guy in the card, the more like followers you have and the more people that like you, the more people that talk to you, the more people that um you know when they put a video up on YouTube, they're like, "Wait a second, this guy did this kind of numbers. Let's let's kind of make him higher in the card because it means people want to watch him." So 
uh, it's really important for fighters to keep on reaching out and, and, and getting being accessible to the media. And uh, we've seen it. There's no one bigger. I guess that's a great transition. UFC 257, Conor McGregor. He's fighting inside an octagon. It's pretty fun. Dustin the Diamond Poirier, this is a rematch. First round, uh, you know, TKO four or five years ago. I cannot wait. Uh, the card is, I love the hooker Chandler. They really needed that second fight. I love that fight a lot. The rest of the card is pretty good. It's okay, but I'm easily going to buy the pay-per-view. If you're listening or watching, uh, if you're listening on the podcast, hopefully you buy the pay-per-view as well. McGregor, Dustin, it doesn't get much better. Uh, that poster sells me on its own. One, I feel like you have to buy the pay-per-view. Those of you that don't realize, um, I don't think my camera froze. Those of you that don't realize, uh, these fighters actually make money based on pay-per-view buys. So they don't get paid the most money. And I think that uh, that's something that you guys definitely have to have to consider is buy the pay-per-view. Um, the other thing that I was going to say is, I, I'm a, one, I'm a huge fan of, um, oh, I'm trying to get my camera up here. Yeah, I might kick you off and then come back in, and uh, I might just kind of run with it and then have you back in. During the podcast version, it'd be fine. Let me... (laughs) We're having a little bit of technical difficulties, but we're going to make it work. But we were talking about UFC 257, Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier. Um, all right, yeah, I think Zach is back. You're back, dude? I'm back. Sorry. Okay. No problem, man. Um, yeah, it's just it's an epic card. Everyone, if you're a mixed martial artist, and what I love about it is I'm starting to get that vibe. I'm starting to hear from uh, different family members. I'm starting to hear from friends who really aren't into the UFC. I'm like, hey, when's Conor fighting? He's fighting this month, right? It's going to be an epic, epic event. Yeah, and there's there's some other fights on this card that I really like. One, I love Khalil Roundtree Jr. Crazy story with him, how he was you know super overweight, lost a bunch of weight, became a UFC fighter. Uh, he had a crazy performance against Eric Anders, who was no slouch. So, and he actually p- planned on retiring. The UFC basically convinced him to not retire, gave him a new contract. So this is his first fight since uh, getting that new contract. So I'm excited to see him in the octagon again. And then we also got Shane Burgos versus Hakeem Dawadu, who I really like that fight too. Um, so those those are two fights that aren't the the main uh, or the the main car or the main event that really stick out to me that I really really like. But yeah, like you said, it's a Conor McGregor card. It's going to be electric. Um, are there fans in Fight Island or no? No, they really tried to. They tried to make it a fan friendly thing and pool parties and music concerts and everyone will get tested. And if everyone's tested, that means it's not in there. So you can do whatever, uh, but they just couldn't pull it. They just couldn't make it happen. Um, I'm pretty sure. I think I'm 97% sure. I hate being wrong on it. I think the, the arena now for Abu Dhabi is kind of up and finalized. And I think it's going to be in a uh, more of like a 40,000, 35,000 like seat arena. Of course, I have fans are still not allowed in there, or, or as you know what I mean. But I think it's going to be a different look. Yeah, and I mean, eventually they're going to have fans, and Fight Island is never going to go away. It is officially, I think, here to stay, which yeah, I think is awesome. You know, especially us in in the media part. Like, if we ever get the chance to go to Abu Dhabi, that would be awesome. You know, that's something that it's there. It's not going to go away, and there's always that chance. And I think. You know, maybe it's not for every fighter, but you can guarantee if the fighters are going to Abu Dhabi, the the, the pay per views and the cards are typically going to be stacked, and and especially once COVID kind of starts to die down and we can get semi back to normal civilization. But I think this card's going to be electric. I think that fight is going to be electric. The the one thing that's bothering me a little bit is I just feel like people are giving Dustin Poirier no credit. They are overlooking him so much, and it bothers me because you know I feel like. Dustin Poirier is a warrior. He puts on great performances every time he's out there. And yeah, he lost to Khabib who hasn't lost to Khabib, but people act like Conor McGregor has never lost in the octagon. Like some his biggest fans. And I'm a fan. I love Conor McGregor. He's changed the sport for the better. He's put the sport on the map and I love that, but he has lost. He's lost to Diaz. You know, he's lost to Khabib. He has lost before. It's not like he's untouchable. Um, I Dustin Poirier, the one thing he does have wrestling. I don't think he'll use it. 
He doesn't ever use it, but you know, and, and I think he has a better gas tank than McGregor. McGregor has had gas tank issues in the past. If this fight goes five rounds, I feel like you got to, it's going to start leaning towards Dustin. I think you would be a fool to think Dustin wouldn't even win a round. I don't think the fight's going to end in the first round. Dustin doesn't get finished typically often. Uh, I think that this fight is a lot closer than what people are thinking about. And uh, do I, I still think Connor gets it done, but I think that people need to kind of respect Dustin Poirier and what he's done in his career. And, and he's not a slouch and he is a much better fighter than the first time they fought. Um, I agree with a lot of what you said there. Um, I'm definitely giving Dustin a shot. So I'm not one of those guys. I think Conor McGregor would win the, is the, going to win the fight. He's the favorite to win the fight. Um, you know, two way classes up against Diaz the first time. I think he just wasn't sure of what he was getting himself into and her beating Romaga Medoff, you can, I would argue or debate the greatest mixed martial artist of all time. Other than that, it's been, you know, 2010 since he's lost a mixed martial arts contest. So there's, you have to do something different or special. And Dustin's up there. Dustin's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, I think my analogy is I think Dustin Poirier is a, um, a Philip Rivers, Ben Roethlisberger. I think he's a, he's a Hall of Famer. A, I love Dustin. Like I said, I met the guy. He's an awesome dude. Is he um, Joe Montana or Tom Brady or, you know, uh, my guy, Josh Allen, um, like a Conor McGregor is. I just don't know if he's capable of taking maybe leveling up to the the number one pound for pound lightweight in the world. Two things that I really want to say. I agree with you. Conor is going to win the first round and I got Dustin winning probably round three or four if it goes that far. But I would want to say we all think Diaz um, has Nate Diaz has one of the biggest tanks in the game chin for days. Conor McGregor did win round five against Nate Diaz. Like a lot of people forget that. I, I think <coughs> the gas problems were just a overwhelming. He just, I think Diaz wasn't sure. And I don't think he ran out of gas against Habib Nurmagomedov. I just think Habib grinds on you and his way to win is grappling and wrestling and submission. And if I can be honest, that's probably Connor's weakness. So I just think it was a bad matchup. I didn't think he gassed. Uh, you know, the, I can I can see the war. I think Dustin is better at that hooker, um, you know, Max Holloway kind of a war. I, I think that. But I think Dust, I think Connor is just cleaner. I think Connor strikes harder. I think Connor does a better job not getting hit. I think Dustin's okay with getting hit if he can hit you. Um, and usually that doesn't go well against Connor McGregor. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. I cannot wait. It's e- I, it's easily probably fight of the year. Uh it's got like that, the buzz of it. It might do the most pay-per-view buys throughout the whole year, and we don't know what's going to happen with Francis and John Jones and Izzy, or if Habib Nurmagomedov comes back. This could be it right away, two five seven. So uh, we can't wait. I am pumped. We're uh, it's going to be bananas. Yeah, one hundred percent. Super, super excited for it. Um, and and either way it turns, like I said, I think McGregor gets it done. But you know, I'll, I'm rooting for both guys. You know, I just hope they put on a great show. I hope I hope we all get to see. I'd be a hundred percent okay with that being fight of the year. If that just, if that fight is electric and super, super stoked for that one. Um, I think after that UFC two, five, seven, I think I'm going to try to jump on and join uh, you and Steve and doing that recap show. I think it's just gonna be so big. Um, I, I can't wait. And one way or another, it's Conor McGregor is back. <laughs> he, he, the biggest name in the sport um, probably gets a knockout a TKO versus Dustin. I bet you he mentions the name Habib Nurmagomedov or Jorge Masvidal. I think there's something there. Connor doesn't waste a moment. I think he might even surprise us with a new name, a um, uh, different weight class, a weight class up. Uh, no one's defeated Kamar Usman. Maybe if he says, hey, Usman, you get by Burns, I want you next. I, the, 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 the landscape changes if Connor wins. Vice versa. If Dustin wins, I don't want to say it's one of the course, the biggest upsets. It's a human, you know, humongous, uh, monstrous upset for Dustin. Dustin kind of takes over the 155 pound division in my eyes. Other than Habib Nurmagomedov, he'll be 11 and one. Has only lost to Michael Johnson in a kind of weird knockout situation thing. Uh, Dustin versus Charles Oliveira, I think, is pretty a tice. I think that's that's the matchup. If Habib doesn't come back, even if he does come back, I would love to see 
Dustin Charles. And then the winner fights Habib or just, just to see that fight to see it, if it's not even for the title. So there's so much there, so much meat on the bone. We're, 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 it's around the corner. We're almost there. Yeah, no, I can't wait. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little upset though that people are forgetting about Justin Gaethje. I know he lost to Khabib, but he's got to be thrown in there somewhere. Come on, we can't. He just, he, we can't just forget about him. I, I will say, I think that Charles Oliveira, if Khabib retires, Coffee and Chaos has predicted that Charles Oliveira will be your champ by the end of 2021. We, I love what he has done. I think on the feet, he's been great. He's, he's evolved, and his BJJ is just ridiculous. Um, so. And any of those other guys tap to that arm bar that he had Tony Ferguson in. So um, I, I'm I'm excited for that, but you can't forget about Justin Gaethje either. I love Justin Gaethje. Um, and it's I, I back to the football analogy. I, I was always a Tom Brady guy, and people were like, how can you dislike Peyton Manning? I didn't dislike Peyton Manning. He's an all-timer, the fifth best, sixth best quarterback of all time. I was just a Tom Brady guy. I just think he was better. That's my thing. Gaethje. Really great fighter. Nothing against him. The guy is three and four in his last seven fights. Like, I think it's – I he's exciting to watch, and he had the really great win against Tony Ferguson. And if you're a Fight Bananas family member community, you know that I think Tony Ferguson's the most overrated UFC fighter of my lifetime. I don't know. I, I, I'll i kind of go in with you, Zach. I think maybe we went over it. He's in the lightweight division, but somehow, somehow missed out on the seven best lightweights in the world in their prime. Like he always fought Showtime when he wasn't Showtime, and he fought Cowboy when he wasn't Cowboy. He never fought Connor. He never fought Habib. He never fought Hooker. And when he fought, he never fought Dustin. And then when he finally fought two guys that he never fought in Gaethje and Oliveira, he got wrecked and got wrecked bad. He didn't look close. So I just always thought, I've always said it, when he kept on winning, and it's like, I, I don't like to be that guy, but I always thought Ferguson was overrated, and now I think Justin Gates, he's a tad overrated too. He's three and four. When he fought, you know, Habib went through him. Like, I never felt, when even Habib, make people make fun of Connor that he topped out to uh, Habib in round three, it's kind of out there that he won round one, and it's like one of those rounds that Habib Nurmagomedov lost, and I thought he looked pretty good against him, and he did lose, but he definitely easily looked better than Gaethje. And like I said, other than the Diaz fight, which is really wacky, he just goes through everyone. He beat Max Holloway. He's beat Dustin Poirier. Um, when Eddie Alvarez was on that unbelievable run, which is a kind of a name people forgot, Gaethje's lost to Eddie Alvarez, and Connors beat him. I just think they're, it's two totally different levels. I really do. Yeah, I think the problem with Gaethje is it's almost like you don't know what you're going to get. Like it's it's some sometimes he looks like he could be a world beater, and then at other times he just he's just very inconsistent. Which obviously in the fight game is not that's not a, that's not a formula for success. Right, and I don't think it's a fault. I I, I I I get what you're saying. I just think he goes out there, chin up, and he and he kind of welcomes the war. He's going to throw his punches and his kicks. And when you fight the best fighters in the world and Eddie Alvarez and Dustin Poirier and Habib Nurmagomedov, those guys will beat you if you do that way. And then when you fight, to me, the second tier, Vic, Barbosa, Cowboy, and Ferguson, you can kind of beat those guys or get through those guys. That I think um, the probably the word I would use for Gaethje, and it's no slight, I think he's a gatekeeper. I think he's the... Fifth best lightweight in the world, which is like people are like, oh, are you kidding? I think he's the fifth greatest 155er in the world. I think he's amazing. I don't think he can beat the top five guys, but everyone underneath them, I think he beats. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. I there are, the thing is with that division, there's just so many good matchups that that I feel like you could make a whole card of just those oh. those matchups, and it would be the most electric card of the year. There's just so many really one through 15. That division is stacked. Um, so I can't disagree. I, I'm a, like you said, I'm a, like, there's a, there's three guys that I just always love and it's Paul Felder, Cowboy Cerrone and, and Justin Gaethje. It's just something about all those three guys that I, I love. I'm like partial to. So, you know, I hope, I hope Justin Gaethje can kind of turn it around, but I, I a hundred percent, agree with what you're saying. And I, I do, I think that honestly, I think Charles Oliveira poses the biggest problem in that division. I really think right now the run that he's on and, and you know who he's, I think he's in line to really make some noise, how he fares against Connor. I don't know, 
I don't know that he's fought anyone. You know, like you said, Tony Ferguson's a guy that hasn't done well against the top, top guys. So I'm interested to see. It's time for him to at least get a shot to fight those guys. If something happens to the co-main event, just say um, Chandler gets COVID. He lives in Florida. We we don't wear masks here. We just go to Target and eat in restaurants. We're Floridians. It's what we do. If he gets off that card, UFC 262 could be Paul Felder versus Cowboy Cerrone, Tony Ferguson versus RDA, Hooker versus Michael Chandler, Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier, and Conor McGregor versus Habib Nurmagomedov in a lightweight pay-per-view lifetime extravaganza. It could be lightweight mania, and Vince McMahon will get 5%. I 100% agree with you. We talked about it on our show. There should be a lightweight uh, tournament for the belt if Khabib retires. And I, we had Conor McGregor win in that tournament, uh, but I think that it would be electric. I think that 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 division is just so good. There's just so many good fighters. And unfortunately, some of those guys are getting older. RDA, Cowboy, Felder. I mean, those guys are getting older, kind of getting towards the, the end. And it feels like McGregor's been around forever, but the man's only, what, 32 years old? So, I mean, we got a lot of McGregor left as long as he wants to do it. Very true. And I, I think it would be so cool if they did all weights in one pay-per-view. It would just be such a line, such a light on the pay-per-view. And then sometimes it's so hard. The heavyweights, like Overeem had a great win against Volkov, but then he goes away for three, four months, and now it's like everyone's talking about Blades or Derek Lewis, who's next. Could be Overeem. He just hasn't fought in three, four months. You kind of forget about him. And I feel like if all the heavyweights, like uh, Sierra Gan just beat JDS, imagine if all of them were on a card. Like you would – some guys just jump off the screen. Some guys you're like, oh, my goodness, he would beat that guy. He would dominate him. And if you see him all in one night, I think it would be easier for the matchmakers, easier for the fans. The fans would demand Overeem versus Nagano. Like, again, like the fans would kind of say who they would want with, like I said, likes and follows and just, you know, buzz and trending and all of that nature. I think that would be a cool idea. You know, just every now and then you got to change it up. They did it with Fight Island. They're doing it with a couple shows a week. I think, uh, you know, late in 2021 or 2022, February, January's flyweights, February's lightweight, and just kind of move up the ranks. I think it will be kind of cool. It'd be fun. I think that'd be awesome. The one thing that I always say is it's so easy to forget what someone does if they fight once a year. But if yeah. you put if you put all of if you put all of them on one card, you're like, oh my god. Well, he fought in January, but. I remember because they all fought in January and this is what ha- it's much easier to remember. Like it's just so hard to, to remember. Like if a guy fought all the way in January and they don't fight again until December, the end of the year, it's like, what have they done? I don't even remember. Cause it's been so long since he's fought. So then you got to go back. You got to read it all. And then you're like, Oh yeah, that's what happened. So with fights being so there's so many of them going on at a time, I think it would make it almost easier for people to remember too. like, okay, well this is where this guy stands because we saw them all fight in one night. Right, right. And we'll kind of end it on this. We, we might have an interview coming on this podcast. Uh, we might add it to a couple other shows. So much going on here at Fight Bananas. We're so pumped. Um, it's just, I talk to a lot of guys off air. I talk to a lot of guys on air about it. There's just, some guys like the the date on the calendar. Some guys like getting paid, whatever the contract is. They want to be in there often, as often as possible. And I know some guys that only want to fight once a year, twice a year, it takes a major toll on their body. They want, as soon as the fight's over, really just like decompress, get away from the sport for a month. When it happens, you gain weight. That's just obvious. You you know, and then you got to ease yourself back into it. Sometimes there's injuries to you or to your opponent and stuff happens. And sometimes you just want to get back in the gym. If you lose a fight, maybe you want to take eight months off because – this fight is really cold. If you lose two or three fights in a row, some of the best in the world, um, the fight will, the game will turn on you quickly. Um, Bellator talks will be talked right away uh, quickly. So it's, it's a hard fight. It's a hard game. And uh, it's just uh, one of those things. It's uh, funny. You just, Kevin Holland's are rare. They just are. He just wants to fight every other weekend and Hey, he had a hell of a year five and zero. Oh, but if he, the higher you go up, I don't think you would beat Marvin Venturi and Robert Whitaker and Derek Brunson and Shemayev, uh consecutively in four months. I just don't think you would. I think he needs more time, get your body right, get the weight off on, or even get a game plan. Those guys are just killers. The higher you go up, I just think you need more time. 
I 100% agree. Uh, Kevin Holland fighting five times a year is not going to happen once he cracks the top 10 because it's just, it's one, it gets the, it gets a, become a log jam up there if all these guys are fighting one another. So there's less fights. And, you know, if you're, if you're the number seven guy and you're on a hot streak, you're not going to fight the number 12 guy just to stay active. It's just not right. going to happen. Right. So yeah, it, it slows down. And uh, I 100% agree with you though. Like every guy is different and, you know, some like to, to take that break. Others want to get in there and stay consistent. But as you get to the top, it, it's going to slow down anyway. Absolutely. Well, guys, I'm Dave Inhoff, and you can follow me on all social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, subscribe to the Fight Bananas YouTube channel. It's been awesome. We've had a really cool up. up. Uh, we just had a couple podcasts, a couple of things out there. Uh, we just hit 1,700 subscribers. Pretty pumped about that. We want 2K. We want 2K pretty soon. Um, but yeah, we're just rolling. We're, we're so pumped to have you guys on Zach and Steve, uh, next week after Holloway cater. Um, and then we'll Wednesday, Saturday, like I said, hopefully I'll jump on there Saturday, uh, with McGregor Poirier result, whatever it is, it's going to be humongous for the sport. And, um, yeah, what's your social media platforms yourself and the coffees and, and, uh, throw those out. Yeah, so you can find us on Coffee and KOs One on Instagram, Twitter. We're very active on there every single day. You can also find us Coffee and KOs on YouTube, and uh, our podcast is on all pl uh, podcasting platforms. And we'll obviously be on uh, Fight Bananas channel as well when we do the the live uh, recap shows, which we're super excited about, and we can't wait to to get started. So um, yeah, I look forward to this to the fights coming back, and uh, super super excited for the opportunity. Absolutely, my man. We can't wait to have you guys. It's going to be fun. And then, yeah, so people are going to be able to see you guys after the shows on YouTube, Facebook, um, you know, where Fight Bananas is for now. And then uh, what I'll do is we'll that will become – we'll record it into a podcast version as well. So if you don't want to stay up to 2.30 or 3 a.m. on a pay-per-view card, uh, if you guys want to wake up Sunday morning after football or church or whatever you guys do on a Sunday, you can pop it in. Or what I love to do – Sometimes on a UFC card, especially pay-per-view, and especially if there's football on Sunday, I like to decompress on Sunday and then Monday morning, whatever it is. If it is Fight Bananas, if it is Anakin Florian, I'm like right away Monday morning. I'm listening to the recap show to really start off my week because I know you guys will – they will lead you into whatever's happening soon, whatever the next week card is. I don't know off the top of my head who's the main event of the next week. I think we're back there in Vegas – I think it's I think it's Overeem and someone I don't know I don't know off the top of my head but um, you know I know it probably will come up and uh, you know it's just kind of it's a good way to kick off the week. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that we're we have a schedule now. We're able to come in the studio and and release it when we wanted to release it. It just it worked out really good for us. Um, and the shows we we plan on we have some some segments that we're going to do weekly that I think will will get the listeners uh, kind of engaged and. Uh, we just look forward to being able to interact with any everyone and trying to put out good product for all of everyone to really enjoy and something to interact with us on social media with too. So really, really excited for it. Absolutely, man. Uh, we're leaving. We got 30 seconds left. Zach, what's your favorite all-time movie? Uh, Law Abiding Citizen. Law Abiding Citizen. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorites. All right. No, I like it. There you go. People will connect. <laughs> <laughs> or will they right, man, we'll be good we'll talk soon and um yeah we enjoy it we're coming very soon coffee and ko zach steve taking over fight bananas and uh we'll talk to you guys later all right so i told you guys i thought that was a lot of fun we're about to get into the grant dawson interview ufc star but uh like i said like i promised here's my dave van Auken three top three ufc fights that we're not talking about that i would love to see in 2021 like I said, I nothing with Habib and GSP, Izzy and Jones. I get all these fights. I would love to see it. But these are outside-the-box fights. First and foremost, let's go. Davison Figueredo, uh, the best UFC flyweight champion, uh, the best flyweight fighter in the world. He's moving up to Bantamweight. How about towards the end of the year, Aljamain Sterling defeats Peter Yan, and how about we see Sterling versus Davison Figueredo for the UFC Bantamweight Championship? I would love that fight. I, I just think it's a it's a humongous fight for the the lightweight classes. I think it's a great uh, you know stylistic matchup. I think that's a really cool fight. I think that's a great poster. You see the uh, the flags on them. I think no one's talking about it. Davison Figueredo and Aljamain Sterling. I love that fight. Number two, 
how, you got to have Chemayev in one of these fights. I thought Chemayev was the standout star of 2020. Uh, and how about the, how about a matchup that no one's talking about that could easily main event any card in the world? How about the fighter of 2019, Georgie Masvidal? How about Masvidal versus Chemayev in the welterweight division? Like these are fights I've never heard this fight, never heard this option. You know, you could talk about BMF. You could talk about Chamaya fighting on short notice. How about Chamaya if he defeats a Leon Edwards and a, or a Kevin Holland? He needs that main event, the fight to put him over the top. And Masvidal is not ready to pass the crown. Masvidal wants to be the fighter of 2021. So I think that's a fight that's uh, not on anyone's radar. But if that happens, that could be like a fight of the year, just mega, mega show. Last and definitely not least... Uh, of course, with notorious uh, the notorious Conor McGregor coming back, and he's fighting Dustin Poirier in a couple uh, a week now. Can't not believe it. It's amazing. This fight needs to happen. This fight is a rematch for Conor McGregor, and it is no, it's not Habib Nurmagomedov. It is Jose Aldo. The world tour, the rivalry was heated, and it only lasted 12 seconds. To me, I think Aldo's back. I think Connor, I, I I don't care, 145, 155, 170, any weight class. I think Aldo deserves, I think he's one of the greatest fighters in any lightweight uh, division of all time. Aldo, I think, needs that redemption fight. I think the rivalry was so good for it to only end with 12 seconds inside the octagon. I would love to see multiple rounds Aldo versus McGregor. There you go. Those are a couple outside the box. Hopefully you liked it. Chemayev, Masvidal, Figueredo, Sterling, and McGregor, Aldo. All right, guys, here's Coffee and KOs with UFC star Grant Dawson. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time! Ten minutes main event is set for one 30-minute interview. Out of the corner, the coffee and KO is true. In the right of the corner, Grant Dawson. Hey, Grant, how's it going? Thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate it. So, um, before we get started into the content, I gotta ask: Are you a coffee guy? Yeah, I would say so. I uh, I drink more when. Um, when I'm in camp because it helps with my appetite and my energy levels. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoy coffee. Is it like a, so a lot of fighters, they get like these fancy brands and they're sponsored and all this stuff. Cause there's, there's so many different brands and things out there. Is it like a organic type thing? Like, is it like something you're sponsored by? Or are you just going like the old, like coffee house type coffee? Like how, how's it, how's it, what are you drinking? I go to this place. It's called, uh, perhaps you've heard of it. Starbucks and oh uh, okay yeah, yeah i i get a uh a black coffee with some sweetener in it <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> I just, that's about the extent that i have all the drinks that i really like on there are all really girly drinks so i have to order them when i have my girlfriend with me and pretend like she's the one getting them it'll be like a caramel ribbon crunch is like my favorite and i'll be like oh yeah she wants a caramel ribbon crunch She'll be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, Shut up, babe. On my side. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's okay. I've, I've actually learned as I've gotten older, like, so, you know, college, you know, you do the party thing, you drink, and it's like the whole time you're drinking, you're like, this tastes like shit. And then you realize, <laughs> like, down the road, you're like, wow, there's so many good drinks out there that taste really good and can get the job done, but you're almost embarrassed to drink them. And now that I'm older and I have kids, it's like, okay, well, I can drink these girl drinks now. It tastes good, and it's going to do the same thing, and it's totally acceptable now. That's why guys are drinking seltzers. Like, every guy drinks a seltzer now. So um, I don't – like, I kind of – I can I can relate, uh, but I do drink my coffee black. I like black coffee. Yeah, I like the, I like the sugary uh, – the sugary ice cream type coffees. But uh, if I do if I do a, a black one, I'll – I guess I put cream in it too. I'll do cream and sweetener is, is my go-to when uh, when I'm in camp. It's got to be sweet. Got to be sweet to get it down. Oh, sweet. That, that's my go-to. So, so do, and do you have a nickname? No nickname? He's got a nickname. I, I do He's have got a nickname. nickname. I missed the nickname. KGD, right? Yeah. Yeah. K KGD. And that that's just, I'm assuming, like, a, like take us through that. Obviously, well, GD, your, your initials. 
so I, originally, like my whole theory was, uh, it's King Grant Dawson, and the issue is everybody and their, you know, King is the same as Pitbull. You know, everybody's got the name, and so I wanted to kind of make it a little bit different. And uh, my three favorite MMA fighters all have initials as their nicknames: uh, RDA, uh, JDS, and uh, GSP. You know, so I just thought, why don't we just take the first letters of each and try that? And I like the sound of it. It's been that for like two or three years now. And and if somebody else doesn't like it, they can get fucked. (laughs) Have you ever seen the movie? uh, I think it's Rounders, but it's like they deal with like the, is it KGB? It's like honestly like a Russian mob. And every time I hear KGD, I think of that and it kind of messes me up. So no relation there. No. And actually there's another fighter. Her name is uh, Andrea Lee and her nickname is KGB. And so wow. I didn't realize that until I came up with it, came up with it. And then I was like, well, as long as I don't fight her, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about that unless yeah. something really terribly wrong goes uh, in the UFC. Listen, we're, we're how many days into 2021? <laughs> yeah, you better be careful. Are Those are big so. words. Those are big words. <laughs> you never know. Very, yeah, very true. Yeah. I don't know. It's, like you said, it's only been seven days and I'm ready to get <laughs> off the roller coaster. Um, so... So at only 26 years old, four fights into the UFC and 17 fights on your resume, would you still consider yourself a prospect or do you feel like your your experience is really greater than that? Man, I I don't know what that means. I don't know what prospect and and cuz I go out there and I beat, you know, the next guy, am I still a prospect or or how many fights are you not a prospect anymore? How many fights are you a veteran? I just go by skill level. Fighter A versus Fighter B. How do I match up against this guy? Um, and I, I think I'm better than all of them. So it really, it doesn't matter to me. Call me a prospect, veteran, whatever you want to say. Because nowadays, it really doesn't even matter with, with your age, right? Like these young kids are doing it. You know, are you, are you going to call a kid that's been training when he was four a prospect? Like, no, he's been training his whole life. That's not a prospect. That, that's, a, that's a veteran right there, you know? And it really just comes down to who you fought. I feel like, and and um, that's what I'm looking for is the bigger names to get that under my belt. Yeah, I feel like, so we actually did like a, a potential breakout stars of 2021 episode. And I feel like we honestly maybe owe you an apology for not putting you in there as a potential breakout star because you are now 4-0 in the UFC. And like, how do you like, how did you like 2020 go? Like, did, did you put like a, like a one to 10? Is that like a 10 for you? Like, what do you want to do next? Man, you know, I wish I could have fought more. Um, but with, uh, you know, the whole pandemic thing, that whole annoying thing, uh, it is what it is. I got I got what I could in. Um, I feel like if I had been able to fit one more in there, I probably would have had some more steam on my name. Um, this uh, Cam Zachamayoff guy, he's getting a lot of uh, a lot of credit and and he definitely deserves it. However, like, I really don't feel like he's done anything that I haven't done. Everybody that he's beat is on a two fight losing streak or not in the UFC anymore. I've beaten guys, uh, ultimate fighter winners, veterans, you name it. Everybody that I have beat other than Nad Armani is now coming off of a win. Everybody that he's beat is coming off of a loss or cut from the UFC. So, you know, to, to see him, you know, he's got all these followers, he's getting all this money, he's getting all this praise, and he re- just really hasn't done anything, you know, extraordinary. It, it's kind of, and, and it's really good timing because he's Russian and Khabib has just retired and they're calling him the new Khabib and he wants to fight at two weight classes, which is really cool. I'm happy for the guy, but, you know, I do feel like I'm getting a little overlooked when it comes to these these up and comers or whatever it is you want to call it. What do you think you have to do? Like, what do you think the difference is between you two that would have to like put you over the top? Uh, I'm not Russian. <laughs> I'm yeah, your basic. Just... I'm your straight white male from Nebraska. So <laughs> I don't <laughs> I don't blame him. I don't have a funny accent. I don't say camo shorts. Uh, <laughs> So it is what it is. I think it's going to come down to what it came down to, you know, back in the day. It's just winning fights. Uh, we're hoping to have a fight here pretty soon. I think I know who it is, and I'm going to I'm gonna beat his ass, and, and that's going to give me the recognition. I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. I'm going to beat everybody they put in front of me until I have that belt wrapped around my waist. And if people want to jump on the, the bandwagon sooner than later, that's cool too. 
I definitely think we're going to jump on the bandwagon. That's the stuff that gets me hyped up, and that's the stuff that I like to hear when they come on the Coffee and KOs podcast. Um, Seems like a pretty solid approach. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the way I, I feel like that, that's the way that you have to. Like, I, don't get me wrong. Like, there are guys that you know, like Conor McGregor. He's he changed the game by the way that he can talk shit. But not everyone is built that way. Like, I know that if I was a fighter, my skill set would not be on the microphone. I know that we're doing a podcast here, but I'm not good at talking shit about other people. So I would not be able to sell fights in that way. So I would almost have to take the Grant Dawson approach and just fight just them. Open a can of twisted tea. <laughs> well, you also uh, have to remember though, like when it all comes down to it, you know, Conor McGregor is Conor McGregor, not just because of what he says, because of how he backs it up. Uh, there's another fighter, his name's Chase Hooper, and he's got a lot of fans and he makes a lot of money and the dude really can't fight that well. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. That dude's not going to be able to spell his name by the time he's 14. Like, uh, he gets beat up in every single fight and he's so tough. He comes back and he wins and, and he, it's just too soon for him. It's too soon for him. He's got a really cool gimmick of that. You know, he looks like, uh, looks like he's 12 and he wants to eat a bunch of M&Ms or whatever it is. And that's really cool. But when it comes down to it, it's about winning fights in an uh, impressive manner and not taking a bunch of damage. That dude is going to have brain damage by the time he's 22. I think we can say we're, a, we're an anti-Chase Hooper podcast just based off of we're big Slippery Pete fans. So in his last fight, you know, Slippery Pete's winning that fight going into round three. And then he just ends up landing that submission pretty much out of nowhere. And it's like, well, you were losing most of the fight. So how much stock do you put into that? But that's every fight. Every fight that yeah. he has had, whether it's on the Contender Series or uh, Alex Caceres. Uh, in the UFC. Alex Caceres whooped his ass just by being smart. Uh, the guy that he beat, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. He's a short dude. He's got a brother in the UFC as well. The guy that he fought uh, for his debut literally knocked him out like twice. And then he got caught in some, I think it was a rear naked or something like that. Like this, this kid is, what is he? 19? Is that how old he is? Or 20? Uh, I think he's, I think he's 20 or 21 now, but he did make okay. his debut at like 19, I think. Yeah. Okay. So let's say he's 20. In two years, if his fight career keeps going like it's going. And you got to think he's only going to fight tougher guys. He's going to have brain damage. And that's not a funny thing. And that's not me talking shit. That kid cannot fight. It was too soon for him. He got onto the contender series. He had his cool gimmick. But we've seen this in the past. We saw it with Sage Northcutt. He was the young, uh, super young guy, got in the UFC at like 19. And, and look where he's at now. He's fighting for one FC and he's getting his eyeballs knocked out of his head. You know, it, it's too soon for these kids. I remember when, when we had Derek Minner on, one, he called out. Chase. Well, he didn't call him out, but he said, give me Chase Hooper. Give me all these young guys. He's like, I will destroy all of them, which hyped me up. But also he made a good point. He said that he feels like he entered the UFC at the perfect time being at, you know, close to 30 or 30. You know, he felt like had he got there sooner, it would have been way too soon. And so I think that what you're saying and what he said, it kind of puts it all in perspective. I, I 100% agree with you in every way that Chase Hooper has won has been ugly and like how far is that going to get you i feel like you know if you're winning fights ugly it's like chris weidman he won his last fight and he looked awful so i mean to me like it's time for chris weidman to hang it up how many of those ugly wins can you have until your career it, people start realizing your career is done yeah and i actually was talking to derek at practice this morning about chase hooper and about you know these younger guys I, I love the contender series. I love every I love the guys that brings I love everything about the contender series. I got in the UFC off the contender series. But I'm telling you, they're they're signing these kids that just they they're not ready. We are the the highest uh the highest level of the sport, bar none. We are the NFL for MMA, correct? These kids are getting in and they're they're they just don't have the experience. I told Minner, I was like, go after Hooper, go after uh, I, I can't think of any other names off the top of my head. Go after these young guys that keep getting signed that don't know up from down, that are good at one thing. Chase is a jujitsu guy in MMA. If he was a wrestler, it would be a little bit different because at least he would be able to control where the fight goes and not take so much damage. He literally has to use his face to get the opponent tired before he can submit them. I'm telling you right now, that's not going to last very long. 
But as a fighter, you know, if you're given the opportunity at 21, like you're going to jump on that no matter what, right? It really I mean, it really depends. It depends on who you trust. I, I was lucky in the sense that I have three very big role models in my life that have guided me through my career. My manager, Joe, and my coach, James Krause, and then my uh, other manager, Jason House. You know, I trust them completely. I trust that they know what they're talking about. I trust that I'm still young in the sport and I'm not exactly sure, you know, they know the angle. I want to be world champion. Take it from here, guys. What's going to get me there safest, have brain cells when I'm, you know, when I'm older and enough money in the bank to, to live off of what I need to live off of. And, and I was lucky in that aspect. And some of these kids don't have that. And they see that shiny thing in the corner and they're just, they want to jump on it. You know, I'm not saying if you get a chance to get signed to the UFC at 21, I'm not saying don't take that chance. That's amazing. Good for you. But you also have to take a step back and look at your fighting style. If your fighting style is I'm going to get punched in the face until you get tired, then I'm going to submit you. Dog, these guys in the UFC, one, they hit a lot harder. Two, they're not going to get tired. They're not going to get tired beating your ass. And that's just the facts. Now, I'm curious because I'm not really too familiar. What is a developmental contract? Because we've seen that on Contender Series before. Like, what does that entail? Like, because are you still fighting fights in the UFC or, or like, are you fighting for, is there another promotion in their developmental contract? Like, what is that? Because I've seen that on the Contender Series and that's almost something that maybe would have benefited Hooper. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm just curious as, as to what that is, if you know. It's basically a fancy way of saying, hey, you didn't get in. Um, from what I understand, like you get a shot next season or you're at the top of the list if they need a short notice. It, it really, it doesn't matter. But uh, one thing that I think they should do with the Contender Series is just make it its own show. You know, uh, the WWE has owns a bunch of little pro wrestling shows that they have. I think the Contender Series should do that. It's doing so well right now. Uh, just make it its own show. Give it belts. Give it weight classes. Give it, you know, signed fighters. Then when you need fighters to fill in shows, boom, you have them right there. They're ready to go. They've been active year round. And you get all these views on Fight Pass or ESPN Plus or whatever the, the streaming service is. Make, uh, make the Contender Series its own show. And the biggest thing that that would help is – uh, you don't have to give them contracts. The, the UFC is filling up and it's filling up fast. It, we're seeing guys off of one loss and gone because they're overbooked. And the reason why they're overbooked is because they keep signing guys uh, that are coming off the contender series. You have one really cool performance. Or you have one little gimmick. They're going to sign you. And, and so they're getting overbooked. And then these other guys are getting cut off of one loss against, you know, these uh, other guys that are really good. I think that's a great idea, and I would love that. That just means more fights. That would be that would be incredible. Yeah, um, more so fights. I'm ready for fights. You know, they used to do Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday. Tuesday, uh, Contender Series. Wednesday, the Ultimate Fighter, and then Saturday, you know, the main MMA. Bring that back. That's what I want. Fights every Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday. This is all I do. I'm watching fights right now on my TV in my bedroom. Uh, that's all I want is more fights. And the Ultimate I, Fighter is actually making a comeback too. They haven't announced who the two guys, like the the, the hosts, are going to be, but um, that's going to be electric when it comes back. I'm actually interested to see how it does because I feel like with the contender series, people are more interested in just fights at this point. You know, like with the with the um, the Ultimate Fighter, each episode was build up, build up, build up, build up, one fight and then done. Whereas the contender series is a little short video of who this is and their dream and they're all fighting for their kids for some reason. Uh, and then you get to watch five fights, you know, of guys that really, really want it. I feel like that's why the Contender Series is doing so much better than the Ultimate Fighter. And I really can't see the Ultimate Fighter uh, doing well after this season. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just I can't see it competing with the Contender Series, which really sucks because one of my goals as a fighter is to be a coach on the uh, the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I'm not. And I also feel like when there's when there's a ton of guys on there, like, and, and, you know, it's the build up, build up. I feel like they can just add so much garbage in there that I don't, I'd rather just see the fights. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm on the side of, I kind of lean towards contender series just because it's almost like a mini UFC card for me. I can watch, you know, an hour and a half worth of fights, not an hour's worth of guys bickering with one another, making weight and then fighting one time. And then that's the end of the show. 
Um, so that that's my preference. But I did have a, a question. So you and Derek Minner, both younger guys, all right, and and have a ton of fights. Is that a Nebraska thing? Like you guys just love to fight that at a young age, you guys are just like, screw it. By the time I'm 30, I'm going to have like 30 fights to my name. Uh, I mean, me and Derek – I would say so. Yeah, it's a Midwest thing. We call ourselves, and I wouldn't say me and Derek call ourselves this, but James calls the Midwest fighters the blue collar fighters. You know, we wake up every day, we go to work every day, and we're trying to we're trying to do this. Uh, I train twice a day, every single day except Sunday. Why wouldn't I want to fight? I want to take fights. Um, Derek goes about it. He's got the mindset of anybody, anytime, anywhere, any weight, I'm gonna fight, and I love that mindset. I have the same mindset. I was going to take a bunch of really stupid fights that were going to get me in trouble early on in my career. That's why I gave control to James, Joe, and Jason. And I said, yo, tell me who to fight. Tell me when to fight them. Don't even ask me. If you like it, just say yes. And I feel like Derek uh, didn't have that early on. And he was just fight, 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 fight. And it still worked out for him. That dude, that dude's a savage. That dude, uh, sharing the octagon with him and then... Uh, after that, sharing the practice room with him, I, I have so much respect for him, so much uh, admiration for his game. He has got an incredible game. And I'm telling you, he's going to beat a lot of guys, like a lot of guys. And just a follow up to that, I saw that. So you fought Minner, Minner fought Kroom. Like, do you guys like build off one another now that you're teammates, like those experiences and just kind of like help each other grow? And now that you're all training together, like, I feel like that that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, we we prepared for Minner. I was Kroom's main training partner when he was set to fight Minner. And then when I got set to fight Minner, even though it was only, you know, we only had 12 days notice, he was my main training partner to fight Minner. Uh, after we fought, Minner came to our gym to uh, to to train with us. And I, I got to tell you, man, it's, it's so it, – he's got such a good – game like he I, just yesterday we were we were in jujitsu practice and i'm picking his brain about how he's doing this this arm bar technique i'm recording stuff i'm i'm trying to figure stuff out i'm helping him with his wrestling like it's just we just grow and build off of each other the three of us and uh he, he's really great to have in the room and so just kind of going off of that like glory mma is definitely kind of blown up in the last year or two like what's what's going on over at Glory MMA? Like where do you kind of see that success coming from? Is it like mainly like James Krause being the coach, or is it just really like a great group of guys? Uh, I feel <laughs> I feel like uh, I feel like it's a, a combination of three things. One, and probably most importantly, is James. You know, uh, having a leader like that, having a, a coach that that teaches you every day, and not to mention the dude just is so smart with the game. Uh, when this whole pandemic hit. The first thing that he told all of us was, be ready. When fights come back, there's going to be a wave of, of, you know, needing fighters in the UFC. Short notice replacements, you know, uh, stuff happening with this whole COVID stuff. And so that was a really big part of our, our gym success is our guys were just staying ready. Kroom took a fight on one day's notice. Uh, Jason Witt took a fight on two days notice uh you know like it's just being this blue collar fighter that is always ready to go and ready for opportunity is what gets us there and then the other thing is our management really knows how to grow fighters you know uh i hate it i hate it when when people talk about you know pad records or or stuff like that because you know if you're 10 and 0 or 10 and 1 no one cares who your first five fights were. I feel like that's the biggest misconception in MMA. And my biggest advice to a, a young fighter making his pro debut is take smart fights. Don't be, don't pretend like you've got a big dick. Don't like go out there and try to fight, you know, anybody with a name because nobody gives a shit who your first five to ten fights were. No one cares. If you're 10 and 0 against 10 turds. Or you're five and five against ten really tough guys. The ten and zero guy is going to get signed over the five and five guy. Yeah, I I hundred percent agree. Go ahead, Steve. I was going to say, uh, so what what is going on with James Krause? Like, why do I keep seeing his name pop up in the news about like he's pissing off some fighter or like his mentor? It was like Diego Sanchez, I think, recently, but like before is Joaquin Buckley. What's going on there? 
Well, first off, James is like a honey badger. He don't give a fuck. Uh, <laughs> he don't care if he hurts your feelings. He's not trying to. He's not trying to uh, uh, settle it down for for people. He's there to tell it like it is. You know, if he means it, he'll say it. Uh, the whole Joaquin Buckley thing, man. I I don't even want to get into that. That dude's a shit box, and and you know, whatever, but, uh, like Diego Sanchez, he's trying to, he was, he, ugh, I can't talk. he has been trying to fight Diego for a long time and it just kind of never happened. And then Diego out of the blue kind of messaged him saying that he didn't like what he was saying about his trainer or something like that, even though they're both a bunch of net cases. And, uh, so he was like, look, I'll fight you. Like, just tell him you want it. I've told them that we wanted it. You tell him you want it and let's get this done. And, and, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's kind of looking like it's going to happen. <laughs> that would be electric. I love James Krause. I've been a fan really kind of even before I started this podcast because he just will fight anyone at any weight class and just doesn't care. And I, I love it. And and the, the man, the master of the short notice fight. Like, I feel like he's like the guy that if you need someone short notice, just call him and, and he'll do it. And I love that. Um, so it seems at 26, like I see on your Instagram stories and stuff that, that you corner a lot of guys and you also teach a lot. It's, it's almost like you have like a veteran instinct or like people, people really trust you. And at 26, I can, I can honestly tell you that I don't think anyone trusts me. So kind of what's, what's that like? Well, man, I mean, it's kind of hard to argue with my, with my success. You know, I'm, I'm 16 and one. Uh, I've only got two decisions in my career and I'm four and zero in the UFC. Uh, I've bonus, you know, I've beaten a lot of good guys and I've made it look easy. Uh, the other thing is I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a really good coach and I'm not trying to say I'm, you know, on James's level or anything like that, but I'm a very, very good coach. And these younger guys, I really love helping guys that I see myself in. All you have to do to get on my good side is work hard and show up every day. That's it. If you do that, I'm going to, I'm going to grab you. I'm going to put you under my wing. I'm going to show you everything that I know, no questions asked, you know, and I've built a relationship with a lot of these, uh, these fighters, like really, really deep relationships with these other fighters, my teammates, my brothers, you know, um, just the other day, or it wasn't the other day, it was a couple months ago. One of my, uh, one of my teammates, his name's Muhammad. He's six and zero as an amateur. He got a fight on one day's notice in Iowa. So we got in the car, we drove up there to go fight. And I do it again. You know, I love that kid. He works his butt off every day and he listens to everything we tell him. You know, if we told him to do a cartwheel and a backflip in the middle of the cage, he would do it. And those are the kind of guys that I'm, I'm willing to lose money on. I'm willing to drive 10 hundred plus miles, uh, sleep in crappy hotels, all that stuff for, you know, they put in the work. I see myself in them trying to make it. And, and, you know, you just kind of build a bond when you're, when you fight somebody every day, you kind of just build this bond with them. When, uh, when the MMA career is over, is that something you're looking to do is become a coach or maybe even own your own gym? Uh, not own my own gym. Um, there's one, one flaw that I have when it comes to coaching and that's, I hate coaching normal people. I don't like coaching people that are trying to lose weight or, or just want to do it for fun. I'm here to coach athletes and winners. That's what I like to do. I hang around winners. And, uh, so when you're when you're an owner of a gym, you got to be able to coach those those kind of people because they're the ones that pay the bills. And I just I don't want to do that. I got my own plans for uh, after retirement, but um, uh, owning a gym isn't one of them. I see that. Is your is your girlfriend a fighter, too? Yeah, she's a professional fighter. She's undefeated. One and oh, which, you know, one and oh, she's great. She trains every day just like I do. She's she's awesome. Well, I was going to say, like, what's that relationship like? Like, because we've all we've interviewed Miranda Maverick, who her boyfriend is not a fighter, but he is like the most jacked guy I've ever seen in my life. And I asked her about that. And then like, so what's your relationship like with, you know, you're a fighter. She's a fighter. Like if you get into arguments, like do those get like real testy? <laughs> she's going to like drop you down and like throw you in an arm bar or something like that. <laughs> well, First off, fuck Miranda Maverick. And second off, um, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's whoa. that about? What's that about? <laughs> Oh, nothing. Uh, she's not my favorite person. Um, wow. But uh, L, my my actual favorite person. You know, she's 105 pounds. She fights at at Adam weight. So uh, 
you know, if, if we get into a little argument, it never gets physical. And uh, <laughs> she's, she's great because, you know, she understands cutting weight. She understands the grind, you know, like it's just, it's so amazing to have somebody that like gets what you're going through. When you're in the middle of a fight camp, you're hungry. You just got your ass beat for the hundredth time uh, this week. And it's only a Tuesday. Uh, and you come home and you just want to like lay your head on the couch and not talk to anybody. She gets it. She understands that. She understands, you know, uh, it's just, it's so nice to have, you know, somebody in your life like that. I've dated other fighters before that weren't as committed and, oh, we should hang out more. And, oh, let's miss practice tonight. She's not like that at all. And then I've dated girls that, you know, aren't fighters at all. And that's just the worst you know uh so i i really got lucky and and it's it's really just great to have her in my life also she's a nutritionist so in fight camp it's it's always nice to have that in your back pocket i need i need my wife to become a nutritionist because well, god i eat like dog shit that, that is not um, happen. i will I say will though tell I, you, I will tell you it's pretty terrible when you're outside of fight camp when you're not in fight camp having a nutritionist <laughs> as a significant other is not great <laughs> I, I will say though, like, like I'm not a fighter, but I could only imagine like it's probably much, much easier to be a fighter and be with someone who is also a fighter because just know like all the guys we've talked to, like it sounds miserable when you're, you know, working and, and trying to, you know, cut weight and prepare for a fight. And I definitely would not someone want someone breathing down my neck, like to do shit when you're, you know, you're working. Right. And one of the best parts about it too is is what you're talking about where when I'm in camp, she takes the workload, you know, the, this needs done, this needs done, this needs done. She does it. And when she's in camp, she still does. No, I'm sorry. Uh, then it's my turn and I do all those things for her. You know, like it, it's it's nice to have that type of understanding with each other. And it's also nice to date or to be with a 105 pound fighter because, you know, they don't fight that much. There aren't very many of them out there. So it's usually me that's in camp. Um, so something that's kind of gone on that I noticed through your career is you've kind of moved between lightweight and featherweight. So how do you like decide which division you want to fight at? Like, do you just, is it make more sense to cut weight or is it, if you're more of a natural lightweight, do you just stay at that? Like, how do you make the decision there? Man, uh, for me personally, I am, uh, staying at lightweight. My next fight will be at lightweight. Um, my next couple of fights will be at lightweight and barring something goes terribly, terribly wrong. I can't see myself going down to 145 again until I want to become double champ. Um, it's just, it's so hard to make that weight. I missed weight, uh, when I fought Derek Minner, uh, and he was a G and took the fight still. And then in my last fight, they gave us a catch weight because we had to fly and all that. And it was still so hard to make that weight. Um, it, it was really hard to make, you know, 150. And so it, that was really an eye opener for me where it was like, I'm, I'm not a featherweight anymore. And if I am, I can only do it one or two more times. So I might as well just save myself the, uh, the trouble and the embarrassment of missing again and, and move up, you know? So we're moving up. We're going to, we're going to take this fight and we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to get that belt at 155, And then we'll talk maybe about going back down to 45. So I see on your Instagram story often that that you like to go bowling. What what's are you an avid bowler and what's the best score? I am a terrible terrible bowler. However, uh, my teammates and I we have a we have a group and we all like to hang out. We're there's six of us. We're all like you know really close. And so our our kind of our thing to do is on uh, Tuesday nights to go to main event and we go bowling, laser tag, and play sh uh, shuffleboard. And so it's kind of just a night for the guys, you know, midweek, uh, getting that first hard practice out of the way. And then, and then we like to go, uh, go chill out for a bit. Were you good at any other sports? Like I know a lot of times wrestlers and like fighters, they get a bad rap. Like, I mean, mo like a lot of them, if they, you dedicate your life to wrestling, like a lot of times you don't mm -hmm. play any other sports. It's just dedicated to wrestling. So are you good at, were you good at any other sports or is like wrestling kind of, that's it. You, that's all you did. Yeah, I suck at everything, man. It's wrestling <laughs> and uh, wrestling and, and MMA. Combat sports is what I'm good at. I'm I'm so bad at uh, at pretty much everything that isn't that. You know, uh, I'm I'm bad at bowling. I'm bad at shuffleboard. I'm bad at laser tag. Uh, 
but it's a lot of fun. I get to hang out with my guys and, uh, and, uh, yeah, so it is what it is. This is a kind of a random question. It's something I've kind of noticed from in, doing these interviews, but so in your Instagram bio, it lists that you, you love anime. Why does every UFC fighter love anime? Cause anime is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I just like I don't know I never really got like super into it but I swear like every single UFC fighter loves anime I just didn't know if there's like something about that I, I don't know uh I wouldn't say every single UFC fighter likes anime but a good majority of them do I feel like it's a really nice it's a really nice uh I don't want to say background it's a pastime until the next practice uh I don't know and you like anime do you like family guy yeah that's is that technically anime okay so you like cartoons it's just an american anime no it's an american anime it's a cartoon like what's the difference you know uh, i i, I know. really enjoy the, the anime <laughs> i really enjoy family guy cartoons i'm with it i honestly i'm just a big kid i literally get to play a game for a living so the rest of my life is going to be you know based around things that i enjoy i enjoy cartoons i enjoy you know uh Geeky stuff, Star Wars. Star Wars. All you that said you love Star Wars, stuff. right? I love Star Wars. Are you like Absolutely. a Are you like a first six, or are you like the new age? Like where? Which one do you like better? Uh, I'm a first six. Um, the Mandalorian is what saved the Star Wars universe for me. Oh, dear. the last three movies were kind of terrible, and I, I shouldn't say they were terrible. They weren't very good, and uh, the Mandalorian really saved saved uh the universe for me and and so i'm so happy it's in there i really like the original i'm sorry not the original three the prequels with the the jedi and the clone wars i really really like the clone wars that's my favorite um but i really enjoy the whole six as a as it goes i i think the mandalorian's overrated you think so yep uh can i tell you real quick that you're absolutely wrong no dude it well okay <laughs> let me just say i haven't watched season two yet i just finished season one and it just it just didn't do anything for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I might be ashamed to say this, but I th everyone says I was deprived as a kid because I've never watched Star Wars. I've never watched anime. I never watched any of those That's, things. Like I, I, I like, I like, I grew up on like Rudy and major league. Like my dad was a huge sports fanatic. I never grew up on that type of stuff. Like my, I don't know that my dad's ever seen Star Wars. So like I've hmm. never watched any of those things. So like people that I work with, He's my best friend. He loves that stuff. I've never seen it a day in my life. Well, we can we can, you know, bring your issue to you just have bad parents and uh, <laughs> fair that, enough. That, I, I I don't know what to do with this other guy over here, but you know, it is what it is. I'll I'll pray for you guys later. That's fair. That's fair. I appreciate that. <laughs> that that makes me feel like we're friends then. If you're gonna if you're gonna say a prayer for me, yeah, at least. <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll fit you in there. I'll fit you in there. Oh, that's, that's the, very nice. The anime gods. Um, all right, so we don't want to keep you too long. So we have two, two seg well, three, but really just two segments um, for you, and then we can let you go. They're they're typically pretty quick. So the first one is called significant strikes. So um, our wives, or I'm married, he's married, Steve is getting married. So we normally like to feature our wives in some way. So they let us do this. So we have them formulate each formulate a question for you. They don't know who you are. They don't do any research. They just ask a random ass question and you have to answer all three and then pick which one you like the best. And then we keep tabs. I won in 2020. So I'm defending the belt here in 2021. Let's go. And I don't know which one, uh, which one of them did the questions. No, I'll tell you afterwards. Okay, cool. All right. So Carrie's going to run a little. All righty. So the first question, if you could transform into any superhero at any given time, who would you choose and why? Are we talking like major superheroes or just any superhero in existence? I'd say anything. Probably anything. Oh, man. Oh, I don't know. I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I would probably say, I'd probably say Captain America. Um, he he's he's got uh, he's one of my favorite super. He's basically Batman with superpowers. Uh, he's got your strength and your. He's just good at everything. I, I like that that he's just 
good at everything that he touches. I'd probably say Captain America. All right. I think I would go Deadpool. I think it's awesome that he can just chop his hand off and then nice. grow it back. <laughs> my only my only issue with Deadpool is Captain America is still still good looking. Deadpool's a fugly. Oh, he is, yeah, he's atrocious looking, looking. I feel yeah. like his personality is kind of like mine, so I feel like I'm I'm semi similar to him as far as personality goes. I also um, feel like with Deadpool, he's got the type of powers that like everyday life like if you're Deadpool, you have to be a superhero because all he really is is invincible. He just can't die. You know, like with uh, Captain America, you got super strength, speed, you know, you can do this, these kind of things throughout everyday life. You don't have to be a superhero. Although imagine if you were in the middle of a fight and you were like about to get choked out, but you just like turned into the Hulk and you just started smashing everyone. Well, you cool. would get disqualified. So <laughs> <laughs> pretty sure at that point, that's yeah, a PED. So. <laughs> yeah. If I'm, if I'm Captain America, I can just pull his arms off of me with my super strength. And I could just be like, oh, I'm really good at fighting, guys. True, true. All right, question two. What is the most useless wor- word in the world? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> the most useless word. Moist. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I think a lot of females would appreciate that you said that that word should get should get uh should get axed. <laughs> because nobody says it. Even even when you something's moist, they don't say it because oh it's damp. Because they don't want to be the guy that said moist. I feel I feel like when someone like describes how a cake like a cake is moist. moist yeah. Ugh. You you don't you're a fighter. You don't eat cake, so it's. I understand. That's bullshit. Like you would... I eat extra cake. <laughs> uh, all right. Last question. What's the worst smell you faced when fighting an opponent? <laughs> I feel like it can't smell good regardless in there. I mean, that's... I don't know. I don't know if I've ever like smell like I'm more worried about them punching me in the face. <laughs> you never had a moment where you're just like someone was laying on top of you and you're like, this smells terrible. Well, first off, I don't get taken down, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, Steve, come on, dude. We want him to come that. back I on the be, show. I shouldn't know that. Uh, no, I... No, I can't... I guess I, I, it wasn't bad. The only time that I've ever, ever registered a smell in a fight would be... I fought this kid named Christian Camp, and uh, there was a lot of blood. There was... It, it's the bloodiest fight I've ever been in. Um, and I just remember I was slipping everywhere because his blood was all over the place. Ugh. And I just remember, like, I'm on, I'm in his guard and I'm dropping these elbows and blood's just going everywhere. And, and I remember being like, I can distinctly smell blood. Like, this is what like blood iron? smells like. Yeah. And I Ugh. wouldn't say that it smelled bad, but it just – I've never, like – because I'm sweaty too. And I spend every waking minute of my day in a gym. So, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty desensitized to, to, to uh, smell when it comes to that kind of stuff. But I would say blood was the, the thing that I smelled, that I registered. I think it was Scott Holtzman who was telling us that he just straight up shit himself in the middle of a fight one time. Which is hilarious. Are you serious? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah he, he oh, said man, that. That's the worst. I think he said he was like trying to like escape a choke or something yeah. like that. And yeah, it just shit, like, shit happens, man. Yeah, that's, seriously. That's exactly uh, right. I, I did <laughs> want to ask though, like, so like before you go into a fight, obviously, like they have to check, they check your fingernails, they check all that stuff. Like, are you allowed to like rock deodorant or is that like not allowed? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, I wouldn't say people do it. I, it's really the last thing on my mind is, man, that guy smells bad. Well, you could tell we're not fighters because I feel like that is like the first thing I'm slapping on. Like before I got there, it's some deodorant. Sweat too much. <laughs> I go a little, ri- little right yeah. guard action, like so. It's you know the dry stuff, but yeah, no. Um, have, you seen those, have you seen those commercials for the deodorant where the the gym teacher is like, "We're not moving on until this guy sweats." That's such. I a haven't seen thing, it, man. Oh, but that's it's funny because like gym class. I am a gym gym teacher. Oh, there you go. There There you go. go. (laughs) Yeah, it's a gym class, and like the dude, everybody's soaked in sweat, and the dude's not sweating like at all because he's got this spray on deodorant. And I'm just like, man, that commercial is for people that don't actually work out. 
<laughs> and and that, those are that's how you know people don't know anything about deodorant because spray deodorant doesn't work. You need to use Thank antiperspirant. You. That's what, and even that's hard. Like even that, that's hard on some people. Yeah, people don't understand how to smell good. Um, all right, so those were the three questions. You had the superhero, you had the useless word, and you had uh, the worst smell when you've been fighting. You can choose which one uh, you thought was the best. Uh, I'm gonna go with useless word. Let's go. That's me again, baby. My my so life's been on a roll. You know? My, I don't know what it is. My wife is like very good at asking the best shitty question ever, and, and she's the, just very good at it. What was the last the last question that won? The uh, oh god, I don't. It's been a while since we've done an interview because of the holidays and stuff. So I don't, I don't remember. Uh, we've had we've had some good ones. Um, I, I can't was remember. It, was it this? If if you are you weak or strong? If you hit yourself or something? Oh yeah, if, I think the last one was with Jay Perrin. And he's a, he's a friend of our show, and he asked if you. If my wife asked if you hit yourself. Are you strong or are you weak? If you hit yourself, are you strong or are you weak? I yeah. Personally, I, I think you're get... stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, like well, <laughs> idiot. Well, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Like he thought it was great, and I. I mean, I can. I. Kind of like I get the question, like, do you think you're strong or do you think you're weak? But like, I don't know. Like, you can you can look at a bunch of different ways. Like, are you mentally strong or are you mentally weak? Because I feel like you might be might be mentally weak if you're punching yourself in the head. Hmm. So I don't That's know. That's fair. That's fair. Um. All right. So Steve just has rapid uh, rapid fire, and then we uh, we just let you have the floor, and you can you can plug any sponsors or anything you want. So Steve, take away rapid fire. All right, so rapid fire. I'm going to give you two options. You tell me which one you prefer, and there's also a few questions in there as well. Um, so crowd or no crowd? Uh, crowd. Apex or Fight Island? Fight Island. Hometown Fight Night main event or main card on a pay-per-view? Main card pay-per-view. First round finish or getting a decision win in a back-and-forth war? Are you crazy? That's first round finish. What would drive you crazier, a bad stoppage or a bad judge? Uh, bad, G bad judge. Yeah, come on. Yeah, screw, Chris, screw, screw Chris Lee. They need to get him out of there. He is awful. Yeah, 100%. there's a lot of them. And I actually have – I think I have a way to fix judging, but they don't ask me. So, I, I could. We could ask you that. How do you fix that? I wouldn't say you could fix it like or permanently, but it. one way, one way, two ways to make it better is uh, five judges and five judges instead of three, and then um, open scoring. And uh, the reason, if you can convince three out of five judges that you won the fight, then it's pretty obvious that you won the fight. And the other thing is, uh, did you see? Did you guys see the whole thing when James fought? Uh, I'm blanking on his name. The when he went up to 85 the, and the Brazilian fought. guy. No, no, no. It was the the black kid. Um, what? Travin Giles. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. So he fought that guy, won the first round. He had the dude's back for four minutes and thirty seconds. There's no way you lose a round if you have a dude's back for four minutes and thirty seconds. One judge gave Travin the or Travis or whatever his name is uh, the first round. That judge. Was his teammate? Oh, I mean, yeah. How does that work? On. That's that would yeah. literally be me judging James's fight. And a hundred percent, if I was judging James's fight, there's no way he's losing a round, not a second of a round. I don't care if he gets his nose split open, his face beat in. I'm gonna say he won the round. I don't care. That's why I'm not a judge. But. My theory on it is if there was open scoring where the whole crowd and everybody at home knows who wins that round, he wouldn't have given that round to his training partner because he would have said everybody is going to see somebody give that round not to James, and they're going to immediately call bullshit. So he would have been more honest about it, and given James the round, James would have won the fight. We just we did a post today about open scoring because Dana White came out and was just like very against it. And it seems like a lot of the people didn't like it either. But I like where Which you're coming is, from. Wh wh why? 
My only question is why? What does it it's change? Honestly, it's from a business perspective of just like if you know – like he was saying like there's not going to be any suspense going into the final round. So it makes for a worse product because if you know you're winning, you'll just stay away and it won't be eventful. But if you know you're losing, you're going to fight your ass off to get the right. finish. Not yeah. to mention – not to mention, mo not all, not all, but a good majority of fights, you know who's winning. Yeah, I you agree. Know? I, the, I think it's the only thing, the only thing that it's going to change is if you think you're winning, and you're not, you're going to go out there and you're going to fight your ass off to get the win. You know, or in a super close fight when it's really, really close, you're going to know who's winning. And so you're going to go into this third round, not just assuming, oh, I'm winning or, oh, I'm losing. You're going to know. And so then you're going to go for it. It's really hard to stall. It, it, look at look at Chael Son and Anderson Silva, their first fight. He's up very clearly four rounds to zero. It, it's so hard to stall in an MMA fight unless you're, you know, you get the takedown and you're, you're laying on them. But if you're going to do that, you're going to do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Think, sorry, you can go. I was just going to say, like, if you're going to stall for five, like the last round after a four round fight, like you have to have one ridiculous cardio anyway to be escaping the whole entire time. And two, you have to just be crazy elusive. Like, I feel like you'd have to almost be like Wonder Boy type elusive and just be able to scoot around the octagon for five minutes, which is not easy to do after you just went four hard rounds. So, well, yeah, I, those, I am those guys fight like that anyway. It's not yeah. gonna, Wonder Boy is going to fight like Wonder Boy, whether he's winning or losing. A hundred percent. And I feel like I understand what Dana White said, but I feel like there's more positives to open scoring than any negative. And, and at this point, the scoring has just been awful. Like it's been so bad, especially the last couple months here before the new year, it was terrible. There was a couple, I mean, like the Paul Felder fight, like he clearly lost, I think every round, maybe except for one. And, and the, the fact Chris that Chris Lee, Lee Chris had Lee. that fight going for Paul Felder is like, how is that fight? A split decision like Paul Felder he, himself scored five rounds to none for RDA winning like it uh isn't Chris Lee a boxing judge yeah that's, yeah that's what yeah, we that, talked about it before that's he doesn't know anything why. about wrestling well it's not about knowing or it's about biasism you know I'm a wrestler if I'm a judge I'm automatically going to score uh the guy who's doing more wrestling you know that's going to look better to me you know and it's not about knowing or i fully believe Chris Lee or whatever his name is knows what he's doing. He just prefers boxing over wrestling so that he likes it better. It's the same thing in real boxing. Real boxing is so corrupt. And so, you know, look at the triple G versus Canelo, their first fight. There's no way Canelo won that fight and they made it a, a draw. It didn't matter. As long as there was no finish, that fight was going to be a draw no matter what happened because they wanted to see another one. And to have those same judges, judge our sport it's it's crazy and ridiculous it's literally having uh it's having college or uh having high school referees ref a nfl game you know like it, it, it's amateurish we need our own refs and we also need to be sanctioned under one sanctioning body the rules are different every state that you go to or every country you go to they have different rules different sanctioning bodies and that's that's ridiculous no other sport in the world does it like that 100 percent. they need to let me be a judge i'll get that shit right every time guaranteed i know <laughs> what i'm looking you're scoring for it for me i'm cool yeah. <laughs> all right if, only if you promise to come back on the show again then you, I'll, you'll I, get my vote every time this is the most fun i've had in an interview probably ever i love it you guys let me know when you want me i'm back on this was so much fun the, the awesome. MMA glory boy, like that's our crew right now. We love you guys. Um, yeah. I have just a few more questions after that. Yeah, sorry. sorry. I, didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, that was a good talk. I like that. Um, if a restaurant had a Grant Dawson special, what would it be? Oh, geez. Probably a triple cheeseburger with extra bacon. Yes. Hold yes. the lettuce. <laughs> Hold the lettuce. <laughs> Seed, seated bun or no seated bun? Eh, no seated no, no seeds. Yeah, that shit gets stuck in your teeth and it's annoying. Yeah, it's just weird. It has a weird taste to it, too. Uh, outside of MMA, what's your dream job? Uh, like anything? Like if yep, anything. Anything. Well, my plan, uh, my plan after MMA is to get into acting. 
So I would say movie Sick. star. That's yeah. uh, that's some of my goals. So what what are like are you, like an action like action films or any acting uh, like the Kingdom reboot? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, actually, uh, my my goals acting wise is to be in at least one giant movie, like one blockbuster sell them out movie. Just anything. I could be the guy in the background. I don't care. Uh, and then my other goal is to actually have my own TV show. So that uh, that's something I'm working on. You should start vlogging. That's I feel like that's how it starts. Do YouTube vlogs. MMA Glory reality show. Do it. Let's that go. would be great. That would be <laughs> awesome. Go. Hey, I'm down, man. I'm down. I like. I've been trying to get my own YouTube channel started. It's just so hard because I don't know like the 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 filming and editing stuff like that i don't have time to do it and to like hire somebody to do it costs an arm and a leg and i've tried and then the good the guys that i can get to do it for cheap they take forever to do it so i'm still working out uh that but i actually do want to launch my own uh like my own uh ufc embedded have you guys you guys watch that i want to mm -hmm. do that for my fight camps um but uh and i'm gonna we, we call it a kgd tv and so, oh, nice. uh, yeah, I just need to find the right camera crew that can get it done uh, in a timely manner, but we'll get it figured out. All right, we're going to finish up quick here. Max Holloway, Calvin Cater. Calvin Cater. Conor McGregor or Dustin Poirier? Conor McGregor. Let's go. Describe your fighting style using one word. Win. Let's go. That's that's rapid fire for you. If If you start to like us a lot, is there any chance I could pick your walkout song? No, nah, I got my walkout song Damn. fixed. Sorry, dog. What is That's it? That's all right. Uh, it's a song called Hellfire by Jonathan Young. And uh, I really like it for two reasons. One reason, it's super unique and nobody's ever going to ever gonna walk out to it but me. And uh, unless now they see this and they're trying to be an asshole. And then uh, it's basically about, a, it's basically about a, uh, a priest who loses his faith with God because he falls in love with a woman. It, yeah, it's, it's very unique. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Not, nothing. I, I'll, I'll Sounds accept very the loss. Disappointed. It's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, we always wrap up our interviews with. Uh, we allow you to have the floor. You're allowed to plug any sponsors. Shout outs to anyone. Anything that you want to say, the floor is yours. You can take it away. Man, you know, uh, everybody turns it off at this point because they don't care about who my sponsors are. But I just wanted to give a big shout out to my coaches and my teammates. You know. Uh, they're, they're always supporting me. They're always helping me train. And, and this, this fight we got coming up, you know, I'm, I'm just so excited for this journey that I have with them. And then lastly, I just got to give a huge shout out to the sidewalk for keeping me off the streets. I like that. That's, that's a solid, you should make that a t-shirt. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, Carrie, take us out. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, coffee and carries from his Hey, special thanks to Grant. Thanks for, for hanging out with us uh, tonight. Guys, if you enjoyed this, we are Coffee and KOs presented by HypeBananas.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at Coffee and KOs 1. And next time, we'll see you outside the octagon. There we go, guys. What an absolute great show. Pack show. I know we went longer than usual, but there's just so much content. Hopefully, you guys are ready. Calvin Cater, Max Holloway, Saturday night. Here we go. We're going to have a pack show. We're going to have probably three, four, five shows this week, upcoming week. Big stuff. We have a triple header. Uh, we're going to do all the recap shows. So every event next week. Check out Fight Bananas on YouTube. Check Fight Bananas on Facebook. We're going to have a recap show. We're going to have uh, UFC breakdowns. Where should your money be? Kat Nelson's coming back on. I think we're going to have Felicia Spencer come with us. So an absolute pack show. Hey, big shout outs right now to our guys, Just Blaze Clothing. Check them out at JustBlazeClothing.com. I'll wait for you. If you want to pause the podcast, hit it. JustBlazeClothing.com. They got some of the dopest gear right now. Um, big shout out to them. Big shout out to Rude Venice. Another ones. I love the hoodie. If you don't have that Rude hoodie, uh, they sponsor a lot of fighters. Bare knuckle, kickboxing, UFC. 
Man, big shout outs to Rude Venice. So much, um, you know, our guy Daniel Martinez, he's always in our corner. So much love for him. Fusion CBD products, head to fusioncbdproducts.com. I, I, if you don't have, if you're not taking CBD, CBD um, daily or weekly, I'm telling you guys, look into it. It has so much benefits. My body feels better since I'm on Fusion CBD. And you can only buy it at FusionCBDProducts.com. Guys, huge week. Calvin Cater, Max Holloway, Kiesa Magni, and UFC 257. Dustin Poirier and the notorious one, Conor McGregor is back. Guys, have a great week. We'll talk to you. We'll see you.